Hey, I'm Jared Seidler. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, about 5% of what I'm going to share with you is an original thought I had. I've been blessed to have some really good heroes and mentors there behind me. Um, a lot of you, I think actually all of you probably heard some of the comments I had um, uh, earlier on the panel, so I'm going to fly past some of these slides. Uh, you probably saw on the first slide, I'm really hard to find on social media and the interwebs if you need to shoot me a, an email or feel free to take a screenshot. So again, we farm about 450 acres, uh, fourth, fourth, fourth generation farm. We just per My wife and I just purchased the farm this summer, and uh, right now we raise about 12 crops, or uh, about a dozen crops, you can see it down below. New this year is clover seed, and we're also getting into uh, some dry beans because with all this rain, I think you should grow a bean that literally by definition grows on dry ground, don't you think? So my dad was doing cover crops, or cover crops are cool. The NRCS wrote an article, uh, his kind of, the story they wrote about is we took some neighboring farm that had like a 0.8% organic matter, and we built it up closer to three using a rotation and a little bit, a little bit of uh, lime and some manure. So if you want to read about that, it's a, it's a good article. That guy's my hero. So I've been doing this uh, organic compliant trials for about 10 years uh, because I figured that if, hey, I'll just cut out the herbicides and I'll get a rotary hoe and a cultivator, and if I till my fields like 15 times, I'll go ahead and limit all the weeds, right? That's how it works. That's not how it works, but we certified the first the half of the farm in 19, and then now in 21, the rest will be certified. Um, I'm going to really quickly go through. I was overseas last year, and I had a chance for my birthday. I said, hey, here's some books that some of my mentors and heroes told me to read. And so there you go. There's your homework assignment. You have until Friday. Good luck. Um, but here's the thing about this, and I said this earlier, but it's worth saying again. A lot of the pioneers in this space and one of them sitting right back there, dead center, with Dave. Thanks for joining us, Dave. They had to learn how to do this from scratch because the guys and gals that did this in the 30s and 40s before the Green Revolution, they were mostly senile and dead by the time the 80s and 90s and this was underway. One's on John Kemp. But the, and then Dr. Groover, who I, I think you probably picked up as kind of a kind of a hero of mine, you know, he did a, a this just this was just a couple months ago, actually, Mr. Paul Hoffman sent me this, the Into the Weeds podcast. and uh, uh, season two. I don't know anything else about that podcast. I'm not advocating it, but Dr. Gruber basically in about 50 minutes laid out all of the um, all of the lessons learned, and he really did try to do a good job of laying out kind of a, uh, a schedule or a, hey, this is kind of when we wrote her, this is when we time weed. Uh, because we're down to 10 minutes, I'm going to keep going. Um, yeah, again, uh, David Montgomery, really a lot of what we do, we're cutting way back in tillage in our operation. But again, diverse rotations and uh, integrating cover crops. And again, this, this is huge. This is such a paradigm shift that growing plants build soil. And John Kemp has some amazing stuff on this. I think he calls it the, the, the soil building cascade, but basically better photosynthesis results in increased organic matter. And as I understand, there's actually a farm in Kansas growing corn on corn that's building a half a percent of, of uh, organic matter every year. If you want to build organic matter, the best thing to do is either grow pine trees, rotationally graze, or grow corn, right? We always thought corn was still destroying. Here's, here's a fun one. All right, you think there's a lot of witchcraft between the minerals, the uh, the weed control with uh, you got soil amendments, inoculants, stimulants, controls, sprays, uh, foliar sprays, uh, certified pesticides, humic substances, humates, seaweed. Some of this is pure witchcraft. Other of it is incredibly valuable and useful on a farm. And depending on your farm and your situation, what's witchcraft and what's valuable might change. My goal, my five-year goal, is to be able to speak a lot more intelligently. We keep it real simple. We use cow manure, we use gypsum, we use a little potassium sulfate in row fertilizer with some K-Mag and a little bit of micronutrients. And this year we're doing some soil or some seed inoculants and some uh, foliar sprays in some of our acres. And again, just like I talked about before, Mr. Martins, don't buy yourself an expensive problem. Gary Zimmer says that the, the path to Rome is a lot more fun than getting to Rome itself. And again, I'm really nervous about people who come and they've got the recipe. Fellow shows up in my yard and says, "Hey, I've got, I've got, I'm going to sell you fertilizer this year. I'm way better priced than my current current provider, and their fertilizer for soybeans was mostly chicken manure." I said, "Raw manure right before soybeans? Are you sure?" He said, "Yeah, that's the only way to do it." Well, my manure spreader broke down, and uh, I, I went into a field that was was corn, corn stubble, and became soybeans. This is how clean the corn, soybeans were when I, but right there is where I dumped that load of manure off. I will never put raw manure in front of soybeans again, and I wouldn't suggest anybody else do. Rye, yes. Oats, yes. Possibly clover, yes. Not manure. It's a really complicated system out there. Look at that. That's UW-Madison. What do you see there? 
You see a well-maintained, uh, tuned-in well cultivator. You see a rotary hoe in good working condition, and you see a tine weeder. Western Illinois University, super complicated machinery. What do you see? You see a well-cared-for cultivator, a tine weeder, and a rotary hoe with good wheels on it. All right, some tools we use. This is probably the best money I spent last year on GPS. It's a lot more fun to cultivate straight rows. I love this tool. I think every farmer should have one, a herd seeder. It's incredibly, it covers the ground, frost seeding oats, uh, and Ryan, so when you take GPS and that little John Deere tractor with a seeder, fantastic. Uh, I love this no-till drill. There's a lot of no-till drills. I really like the Great Plains model. I can rent this for 12 bucks an acre for my neighbor. Someday I'll own a bigger model, but it, again, it fits my little tractor just fine. But I got lights on my tractor. I'm out cultivating. Uh, make sure your lights work. Sometimes you gotta go at night. Um, we use a tine weeder. We've got two of them, a 15-footer that I built myself and a 30-footer. They're both Kovar models. You see up here, tine weeding post-emergence soybeans is fine. Don't tine weed post-emergence short corn. It looks like a hailstorm. If you want to simulate a, ha a hailstorm in your crops, you do that. Rotary hoe. I talked a little bit about this before. This is a must-have tool because when you got, got crust on that soil, pre-emergence or certainly post-emergence, you can take out two cultivations with a good rotary hoe pass. And Dr. Gruber taught me, when is it time to rotary hoe? It's time to rotary hoe when it's time to rotary hoe. We're not just gonna go drive our tractor. We, it doesn't need exercise. But if you've got a, so if you've got a, a light, fluffy uh, uh, dirt, dirt mulch, they call it, or dust mulch, uh, that you're good. If it hasn't rained, you probably go out there and sift and look at it. You've gotta get off that, put the truck in park and get out and walk in the field. Love my buffalo. Uh, this is a fun tool. I actually have two of them now. I circle like a friendly vulture until I find them cheap. We like the way it flows soil on my farm, probably in a heavier clay soil, not so much. Here's some embarrassing photos. Look at that top left photo. I did everything wrong in that soybean field. My, my tillage, pre-emergence, immediately post-emergence was junk. You can see there's hardly any height differential between the beans and the weeds. Uh, and you can see bottom left, look at how, look at how much I, I, I completely wiped out one row of beans. Meanwhile, on that corn, that was actually a rescue, but again, the weeds, the corn, uh, that was not managed correctly beforehand. But look at that, that's 2017. You give me five or six or 10 years and I can figure some things out. There's some corn. There's our organic soybeans in 17. Look at how crooked those rows are. Those were not planted with GPS, I promise. This was this year, um, things were a little slower. We weren't as wet as most people, so I'm not gonna complain. I try to only do, I'd like to do one cultivation in corn, two in beans. So here's number one, here's number two, and here's number three. The punchline, that was a conventional, it was a non-GMO food grade, but it was sprayed last year. The weed control was terrible. We planted rye. The rye was basically being overtaken by pigweed and ragweed. So because I'm a stubborn German, I went in there and I planted soybeans again. And that's what it looks like. So you can keep, that should have been a much weedier mess. And I did have some common rag come up. And yes, that's, a, that's my beautiful bride and we still walk our beans. I do not, Gary Zimmer said yesterday, I do not let a giant ragweed plant go to seed on my farm. So that's what, our, that's what my field looks like from the, you see some common ragweed in there. Headlands and soybeans are a mess. That's where you grow buckwheat. It's a wonderful place. Plant it in late June, it comes off. Um, Mr. Campbell in the back spoke, spoke of uh, good best practices there. You can see, 2017, there's some of our, that's what our soybeans look like. That was 2019. So yes, you can grow relatively clean beans uh, in an organic system. We were talking outside about the weed zapper. It's fun, it looks cool. I, I don't know, to me it sounds a lot like stray voltage in a dairy system in the 80s. A lot of sick cows and a lot of mastitis, but you'll, you'll see these things where, things that make us happy, like zapping a, a ragweed or doing some really deep tillages, it feels good at the time, but then you look long term and I think, I think sometimes we're, uh, we're taking one step forward to take three steps back. I really am, a, I really am passionate about learning, not just reading, so I, I linked up with this young fellow named Dr. Joel Groover and went down to his farm, drove the 13-hour round trip and learned how to cultivate. Um, this is a terrible Santa corn, but you can see there, look at, so don't, don't look at the corn, but look at, look at the soil and how that flows, and that's a Gary McDonald cultivator. This is, uh, I went to Gary, that is Gary McDonald, and that's my wife being attacked by a bee in the background. That's one of my favorite sets of photos. Um, she didn't get stung, but Gary's a, a mentor, and actually, I don't want to take credit, but I, I did take a series of videos of him about three years ago. This is my friend Paul, his sister's in the audience today. Um, you know, he's one of the, the best organic farmers I know, and there's his super high-tech, right? A six-row planter on a, on a gas-powered 460 farm all. All right, so I'm, I'm gonna figure this out. I'm gonna build me one of these. So I got about five of these cultivators. Of course, they were mostly all rust. By the time I sanded them all down, I built one. And I got out in the field and I couldn't make it work. I, didn't, I did not lengthen out the arms, so I didn't get good soil flow. I had the wrong type of shields. Uh, this has been parked for two years. It's coming back out this year. I will get this to work because I saw Gary McDonald uh, cultivate with one of these and it was awesome. If you do not have GPS and you're not cultivating on GPS, 
That is the most valuable tool you can buy. Get yourself a cultivator wand. That is amazing. You run it right over, you set it 15 inches off center, you set, it, you set it right on the row, and it's just wonderful. This is something I did, this I'm proud of, or not proud of, but this is a best practice. Copy this. Your planner should be planning on exactly 30 inch rows, and if you have any slop at all, when that row comes down, if it twists at all, rebuild. We went through that old antiquated white planner, and we put all new bushings and arms in it, and now when those six units come down, they are in exactly 30 inches, and there is no slop on the side hills. If you have a sloppy planter, you will not be able to do good cultivation, certainly not good row crop cultivation. Uh, no, uh, inspired by Dr. Gruva and Dr. Silva, I have tried the, the no-till bean thing. This was my first attempt. The white clover came in so badly, it ended up becoming cattle feed, which again, the redundancy of having cattle on your operation. I learned my lesson, right? Clover can ruin soybeans. Nope, I tried again this year. I went and frost seeded some clover into a stand of really thick rye, planted my soybeans, crimped the rye, it looked, because I was going to take off rice, or I'm sorry, clover seed and soybeans, use my seed cleaner to sort those out, and uh, it, it turned into a mess about August. It looked good until about August 1st, and the clover just completely took over the beans. I'm going to plow that down and make it corn next year just to see how, what kind of yields I can get with no inputs. Again, GPS makes life a lot easier. Came in this time on six inch rows. We plant and then crimp. That's what works best for me. And uh, again, probably aiming towards uh, crimping a little bit later, letting those beans uh, get a little bit taller. You certainly don't want to crimp in the crook stage. I have to crimp. I can't make it work one time. I have to. I run down and I turn right back around and come back. And I don't have any issues with the rye popping back up. It lays right down. Um, and then just Dr. Groover's tried this. I did run my buffalo through some of my uh, um, plots and uh, no issues. I didn't even take off the disc killers. And uh, it was eight bushel less, but look at that, look at that top right, look at that beautiful soil. I got volunteer rye growing, I got, it's covered. I didn't take any organic matter loss in this field, I'm confident. Now look at that. Those are my conventionally tilled organic beans. See that loose dirt with a putrid little puny rye crop? So looking 10 years out, what is better? That I, I yeah, I was eight bushel lower, but look at how much more protected that land is versus that soft soil. I'm gonna have erosion there. I'm not gonna have big gullies, but some of that topsoil is leaving my farm. And I'm not gonna be happy about that because my limiting factor is probably CO2. Uh, I've tried the Jack Ursum, uh, the you know, planting rye and soybeans at the same day, or near the same time. Uh, it turned into a weed mess. My neighbor did it in 2019. It was the cleanest beans I'd ever saw, uh, I'd ever seen in an organic system. It was so clean, I thought somebody had sprayed his fields. We do a lot of aerial seeding. I love this. We do this on almost all of our corn acres. We aerial seed rye. Uh, we, Dr. Groover spoke earlier about the co solar corridor experiment. We're gonna be trying some of that on 60 inch rows with 20 inches of, um, uh, we're gonna do basically organic strip till. We're gonna try some this year. Oh, let me go back one. So here are some possible organic rotations. The old, the, the best one is still the old dairy farm corn followed by oats with a couple years of hay and then back into corn but you need critters. And I think yesterday there was one dairy farmer in the entire crowd. The Klaus Martens rotation would be corn with a rye cover crop then into beans, uh, followed by winter rye, winter barley, winter wheat, winter spelt, and then a cover crop after that. The new Gary Zimmer rotation he talked about is a year of building and then a year of, um, a year of building and a year of profit, corn and rye, we do this in some of our land. Uh, we're trying now a new system where we're flipping number two in its head where we do no-till soybeans, then corn, and then my small grain. I'm putting my, my rye into my corn afterwards. And then of course at the bottom there, I've got the, uh, the old strip till uh, system as well. Your certifier for organic certification, you are paying them money for a service. When you go to McDonald's and you buy a Big Mac and the food is cold and the people are rude, do you go back there? No. So if your certifier, if you call and every time you call and ask them a question, they treat you like a pest and they're blunt and they tell you the rules, I don't think they need your money. I wouldn't pay them any. I was working with Certifier X. Certifier X is a very popular name. If I said it, you would know it. They were a huge pain in the butt. They wouldn't answer emails in a timely manner. They wouldn't take my call. So I went over to Certifier Y. They had some bedside manner. Guess what? I now work with Certifier Y, and I'm glad I did. If you want to ask me offline, off video camera, I'll tell you who X and Y are. But you are ultimately paying somebody money, and you deserve good customer service. Because you need to track, and I'm going to talk about this a little bit, because before you buy anything, any type of fertilizer, any type of amendment, you need to make sure your certifier that's okay. All right? Manure, as a general rule, is okay as long as you've got that off-bar manure bedding verification. Basically, as long as you're not using sawdust with like pieces of glue in it, 
If you're just using natural manure, that is fine. You cannot use any human waste, human sludge, but plain manure is fine. Um, if you're using uh, uh, non-organic seeds during transition, you do have to prove that it's non-genetically modified and it's not treated. Harriet had some great advice about if the seed is like blue or light purple, that's probably not what you want to be doing. You can use so uh, seed inoculants, however. Keep all the receipts. I have some in digits, and I cut two, uh, every tag off, I every type of seed I get, I, I cut the tag off one or two bags, and I keep it. And then finally, it's really important, all farmers should do this, but especially organic, everything that comes on the field, everything that comes off the field, and everything that you do to the field, you should be tracking. I use an Excel spreadsheet because it's the year of our Lord 2020, and you know, there's some really cool online, but hey, a small, a small little notebook works. So uh, transition strategies, we basically took all of our hay ground and started farming it organically, which literally meant we changed the, the source of the calcium we used from a non-organic to an organic source. So uh, literally just farming the way we normally farm, we transitioned half of it, and then last year that went into corn and beans. Um, talking about you know earning the right, if you really have some soils that are that have really been heavily fertilized with synthetic fertilizers. I would start with maybe growing some oats and peas. When that comes off, going some rye and clover and then back into organic corn on year three. I know it's 36 months, it really isn't. For most of us, it's two years. For most of you, on the third year, you're gonna be able to take off an organic annual crop. Um, but again, make sure that timing is that that harvest is after that 36 month window. And again, you wanna get as many crops growing in there as possible. Another option, you can absolutely grow transitional food grade soybeans. Uh, we've done this, um, hit or miss. You're gonna spend a lot of time cultivating, maybe some hand weeding to sell soybeans for eight, nine bucks a bushel and really gotta crunch the numbers if that's worth it. Uh, we did not grow transitional corn. We only grew cover crop seed because we knew that we could sell it for, uh, we could use our transitional cover crop seed on our organic acres, that is okay. I'll say again. You can use seed growing during the transitional years as cover crop. Your certifier should not have any issues with that. And again, if you get really bad weed patches, that's where we raise buckwheat. And I think we had a couple of really, really awesome speakers, Dave and uh, Torres talked about growing buckwheat. I put this up a couple years ago. It hasn't really changed. If I had $8,500, here's how I'd spend it. Uh, cultivator wand is a must. Getting your, getting your planter on exactly 30 inch rows is a must. If you circle like a friendly vulture, you can pick up a six row buffalo cultivator and get it in excellent shape for under 4,000 bucks and you can buy a rotary hole for 1,000 to $1,200. All new spiders on a 15 foot unit is gonna run you about $2,200. Get the spider wheels where you can replace the bearings. Do not get the type or when the bearings go bad, the wheel is useless. Um, I'm gonna go really quick through this and we'll do some questions. So what happens if we took a conventional uh, genetically modified a conventional corn on corn system. We compared it on a corn on rye like Mr. Zimmer talked about. So I actually called up my agronomist and I told a little white line. I said, hey, a friend of mine wants to know about how to grow this system. And he said, well, seed's gonna cost you X and the fertilizer with a double pass system will cost you Y and pesticide is Z. Those numbers are up there. I didn't include anything else. But what happens, oh, bottom line, 520 an acre. But what happens if I did an organic corn and rye? So let's buy some organic seed. I paid $83 this year. Let's put some gypsum on, 200 pounds an acre. That's 10 bucks. Two tons of turkey manure is 60 bucks. If you wanna put down in the roll a little bit of potassium sulfate, maybe a little K-Mag, some micros, that's fine. Again, right in the row where the plant can get to them. Now I can grow medium red clover seed for a whole, whole lot less than 37 an acre, but it turns out that's not a nonprofit ministry. So if you wanna buy organic medium red clover seed, it's gonna cost you about you know, three bucks for 10 pounds, I think it was a tour, or three bucks a pound. And we're gonna throw some tiller radish in there. I gotta pay to pull that note, to rent that no-till drill, two passes on 100 acres. Uh, I gotta do some aerial seeding, get my rye established. Uh, I'm gonna buy you a buffalo cultivator. Here, just have a cultivator. Same with the, the rotary hoe, okay? So you're gonna leave this with a, those two pieces of equipment. Uh, looking at Dr. Groover's number, I'm probably a little heavy on this, but I, I estimated 8,000, it's probably closer to 4,000. By the way, that includes the two passes of the drill. So two cultivations, two rotary hoes, two drill passes. And if you can't do that for $8,000, call me. I'll come, you pay me $8,000 and I'll come and I'll cultivate for you twice and I'll tie and weed for you a rotary hoe twice on 100 acres. And then go take your spouse out for a nice dinner because you're organic now and you can afford to do that. That's 228, I'm still cheaper. And I got a 17% profit over the conventional system. By the way, you look at my math at what I sold there, you're seeing 44 plus 44. 44 plus 44 does not equal 100. 
because I took 12 acres and I grew my own oats, I grew my own rye, and I grew my own Austrian winter peas so that I have enough seed to go into the next year and I have enough to plant that cover crop. So with that, I did go a little over time, about six minutes, but there was a fire alarm and I'd be glad to take, Harry and I'd be glad to take absolutely any questions that you guys have.